This is Edward Larson, professor at Pepperdine, went to law school with David Zippel at Harvard. He then went on to do Broadway plays, and Edward went on to do history, got a PhD in history. He's a unique, unique scholar, and we're going to talk about his latest book. But I also wanted to show you a couple of his other books. Um, the last book before this one that we're going to talk about, Franklin and Washington, it's fabulous. And then he won the Pulitzer Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, for Summer for the Gods, which is about the Scopes trial. Watch and hair at the wind, and then get the book. It's fabulous. It's so good. So Edward, I wanted to start with why a book, you know, your previous book was about Franklin and Washington. So why this book? Where, where did it come from? It actually came from the last chapter of the Franklin and Washington book. Um, that came out, and just about the same time that things sort of exploded on the issue of race in the revolutionary generation, um, slavery, race, Washington, all those issues. And, uh, but it came out then. I wasn't writing with that. But what I was writing about in that was the relationship of Franklin and Washington, because nobody ever had. And here were our two most, nobody ever written about them together. There are more biographies about George Washington than any other American ever. And Franklin, the best I can tell, is there, he's third. Lincoln comes in second, and Franklin comes in third. So they're the two most important founders, hands down. We say that now. Every historian would say that now, that they were the two indispensable people for the revolution. The revolution would have failed without either one of them where everybody else, as much as you admire, you may admire Jefferson or Hamilton or, 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 or Adams, they were fungible. There was, that's a legal term. There, there, somebody could have replaced them. But nobody could have replaced Franklin or Washington. And, um, but nobody had ever written about their relationship together. And in that, um, I'm sort of like Bill Brandt's, law is looking for a new topic. And I figured there's a good one, because I had taught American history. How did these two? Key founders, how did they work together? And it turns out they worked a lot together. Um, still going all the way back to the French and Indian War, um, when they were each the um, leader of their state's militia. And Virginia, back then, Virginia and, uh, and Pennsylvania overlapped in the frontier, which is where the, revolution, where the French and Indian War began in the Ohio Valley. But the point was, their relationship went into the Constitutional Convention, of course, when they were both there and two really active people there. And then during the early Washington administration. And by this time, Washington is um, obviously a defender of slavery. He has a large number of enslaved people. And Franklin is the leader, the president of the first abolitionist society in America. He was governor of Pennsylvania. And uh, three terms, you know, unanimously elected governor. And he also was president of the abolitionist society that leads to the abolition of, of slavery in Pennsylvania. And their iteration on that issue, both at the convention, but more importantly, after the convention. And so I wrote about that. And that's their last, their last interaction. Um, even though Franklin was a supporter of Washington's election. As soon as the election was in place, he starts moving for abolition of slavery nationwide, and Washington opposes that, and they interact. And so it turns out when I went on the tour talking about the book, everybody was most interested in that last chapter, which I hadn't really intended. But you know, it caught when, the, when things happened in you know, Minnesota, and all those things were bubbling up. And so even though I was actually more interested in other parts, that's what people were interested in. And so then we thought, well, so my publisher said, well, why don't you just write a whole book about that? And I said, a whole book about Washington and Franklin? I, I think I already said in that chapter everything to be said. He says, no, about the whole issue back then among the founders and of that generation. And so that, and then COVID came, and I had plenty of time to write and research. And so this became... Uh, my COVID project, there was, I knew there was interest in it, but I had known from working with Franklin and Washington on that issue of slavery that there was a lot of very interesting dynamics. It wasn't a simple story. 
So I, I want to, this is the preface in the book. It's the very first sentence, and I want to read it and have you comment it. Again, this is the preface. It's the first paragraph. It's the first sentence of your book. The role of liberty and slavery in the American Revolution is a partisan minefield. What do you mean by that, and why did you continue? Well, it had, be, um, you see, the inst Investigation was a little different. But then while I was working, and there was a lot of research involved in that book, because I was going back to enormous numbers of primary sources on the topic. And it was during that period that um, the New York Times brought out its um, 1619 project, and uh, President Trump brought out with the, um, his alternative version, you know, that was the that commission headed by the president of Hillsdale. And they had competing visions of how of what the revolutionary era was all about. And um, I was already deep into the book, but it became increasingly, well, a partisan minefield, that they were fighting over what was the origin story and, uh, for America. And here I was writing and already researching um, a book that I thought the interesting way to make it balanced was to to deal with both, because the competing view, both the question of liberty. Was the American Revolution fought for liberty? Which, of course, that's the one side of the view. Is that what you meant by American inheritance? Yeah, that we, I was talking about, I was going to look at both liberty. I wasn't going to look just at slavery and slavery as an American inheritance or just as liberty as American inheritance because I do think we are a land of liberty. But we also had slavery then. So what was the inheritance we got from the revolutionary era on both those topics, balance them rather than just one side or the other? And, and why did you pick the time period? Because here's the title, American Inheritance, Liberty and Slavery and the Birth of a Nation, 1765 to 1795. So how did you pick that era? Well, I picked that era because in your very, it's great, you're a great interviewer, um, a great question to ask. Um, obviously, the 1619 Project goes all the way back to the first enslaved people arriving in Virginia. I was interested in the founding era, the revolutionary era. And virtually every historian, we could bring Bill Brands back up here, virtually every historian I know who works in the revolutionary era defines the time period the same way. They define it from the, St the Stamp Act um, crisis. The Stamp Act crisis is where it really begins, which would be the first date, um, 1765. Uh, and 1795, the revolutionary goes through the first Washington administration. As Washington working with Jefferson and Hamilton in the first years of the Washington administration, the first Washington administration, as they try to cobble together what would be the American Republic. Because, of course, the, Constitu uh, the, you know, the Confederation Congress gets its part way. Um, the the uh, Declaration of Independence gets its part way. The Constitution gets its part way. But the Constitution itself is a very cryptic document, document and has to be played out. And Washington administration and the first Congress, very much the first Congress, where Madison was, um, sort of plays out what the Republic was. And by the middle of the Washington administration, uh, by the end of the first Washington administration, by the middle, by 1795, um, we pretty well are done with the revolutionary era and we're into the normalcy period where things, sure, big things happen, but they're working within a framework. So most historians place that, those years as the revolutionary. So I was following their very much conventional dates. Now, it goes back earlier. Certainly, it, you, know, you have to get the threads leading up to, uh, you have to understand where chattel slavery came from. Can and I stop you there? So tell, yeah. tell me what, because that's a term that I, quite frankly, I guess I had read but didn't really understand. So what do you mean by chattel slavery? Chattel slavery was an American creation. And by American here, I'm using <coughs> the view that our Cuban historian did, America being the Western Hemisphere um, and Europeans in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, chattel slavery, chattel is what lawyers use and traditional English common law means property, Pro, um, personal property. 
means personal property. Um, like, well, your cattle are chattel, but, and so is your dog, though that's changing now, so I shouldn't get into that. Dogs now have more rights, and pets have more rights. But <laughs> traditionally, dogs were chattel. It's another book. Yeah, and this chair is chattel. Um, and um, what America created, and it really was more in Barbados, which was the richest and most important of the um, English colonies in the New World. It was more in Barbados than it was in South Carolina. Um, but, uh, and it certainly had its roots in Port Portuguese Brazil. But it's taking these enslaved people and making them truly your personal property so that you can do anything with them that you could do with your cattle or with a chair. Um, that's not the type of slavery that was in ancient Rome. That's, sure, there was slavery all over the world. Um, in ancient Rome, in ancient Greece, in China, in China ancient China, medieval China, um, in Russia, in, yes, it's, it, it is. But the, you know the British. They're such formalizers. They make an every, they, it's just the way Germans and English people think. And uh, Germany wasn't involved in this. And so they formalized these rules in Barbados, the Barbados Slave Code, where literally you, the owner, owned that person and all their descendants by the mother. Think about that. And they could do anything they wanted with them. And, and they, that's what made American slavery or the, the, different. the Western hemisphere different because it was chattel slavery. And it spread to the French colonies of the Caribbean and it spread to the Dutch colonies of the Caribbean. It never spread to the Spanish colonies. They didn't really have chattel slavery. They treated, if they were, if you call them, certainly they didn't have a lot of rights. But it was different in the Spanish colonies. It, of course, England had never had slavery. You've got to, you know, the only way you can understand slavery, slavery in the British, in the English, they were English, not Scottish, so they were old English colonies in the New World, was the fact that England had never had slavery since Roman times. It was totally illegal under the common law. And indeed, so much so that if you were, and this, there's a lot of stories, and I put them in the book, um, if you were, if you owned chattel slavery, if you were from Barbados, and Barbados became the wealthiest, I mean, it would put Virginia and South Carolina to shame. Barbados, but the same was true if you're South Carolina. You would become wealthy there. And the Barbados people, British didn't tend to stay there, but South Carolina would be a better example. They lived in South Carolina with their rice plantations. Well, they would go back to England for education because there were no colleges in South Carolina back then. They, if they wanted to become lawyers, they'd go to London um, to study you know, in the temples. Or they'd go to Oxford because they were rich. But they couldn't take their enslaved people back. Because the minute they stepped in England, those enslaved people became free. Because you needed to have, because slavery always was viewed as a violation of the common law and natural law, the only way you could have chattel slavery or slavery if you want to call it that, was if you had a statute. You had to authorize it by statute, because as any lawyer in the room knows, statute automat in property law, statutes automatically overrule common law. So you have to have a statute that authorizes. So you have to take the Barbados Slave Code, where it was first crafted in the early, mid-1600s, and you carry it up to South Carolina first, and you adopt it in South Carolina in the late 1600s when, the, when they formed South Carolina. And then from there, it's carried to Virginia, which already had a form of slavery, but it was the old-fashioned slavery where it didn't pass to the next generation. That's why there were a lot of free blacks in Virginia. But they adopted the Barbados Slave Code there. It was 1703. And then gradually, the other colonies, the, they are, the Dutch had already done it in New York, where there were a lot of enslaved people. Um, and so, but if you were living in South Carolina with your 300 enslaved people, and you know one was your valet, if you took them to England, if you were now going off to Oxford and you took your enslaved people, the minute they stepped foot on the ground, they were, they were free. 
So you, you use a term that I'd never heard before. And again, you're talking about liberty and slavery. But you called those two terms metaphors for slavery. What do you mean by that? Well, what it turned out is all 13 colonies had statutes that allowed slavery. Now, some had fewer. Some had a lot, like South Carolina. A majority of the people were enslaved uh, blacks. Virginia, it was you know 40%. Uh, New York was 20%, but other places it was like Rhode Island, it was less, or Massachusetts, New Hampshire, it was less. Um, so you had a different numbers of them. But they all saw chattel slavery in their midst. Um, in England, the, the English Whigs, those that opposed the Georges, the Hanoverian monarchy, which they viewed the Germans were coming over George I and George II and George III, to impose German-style or continental-style absolute monarchy in England and take away their traditional liberties, dating from the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights and other things like that. So, and, they, and so the Whigs um, would, um, which tended to be a, John Locke would have been a Whig. Um, we're not talking about an uprising from below. We're not talking about a revolution like French Revolution. Um, we're talking about people with country homes and, and um, property and, and also urban people. And they would write, they took the metaphor of, of slavery thinking back to ancient Rome because they remember classical roots, ancient Rome and ancient Greece, where they had slavery. Not chattel slavery, but they had slavery. And, um, they would say, England, the, the Georges are trying to enslave us. It was a common metaphor used by the Whigs in the late 1600s uh, to defend their own liberty. So Americans who are fighting the British when the Stamp Act, Sugar Act, Stamp Act, and the Townsend Act comes, they're saying, look, if we cannot vote on our own property, on our taxes, if we don't have, if Parliament can arbitrarily or solely impose taxes on us without our consent, we don't have any property rights. They could put the taxes anywhere. They were pretty low. The Stamp Act and the Sugar Act and the, and the Townsend Acts weren't all that high. But in theory, they could put them anywhere they want to. And what would be the incentive? Parliament will just keep raising our taxes because they can just drain, they can take all our wealth away from us. And, what I found and make us slaves. And what that I was found, the metaphor they used. What I found so interesting was, is these are all things we talk about as kind of generating the American Revolution. Yes. The Stamp Act, the Townsend Act. Right. We have John Adams who made a comment that I'm going to ask you to, to repeat. Yeah. Uh, James Otis in a pamphlet. And, and all of those, all of them. in a sense, were new to me. I don't remember being taught those in history as to using this metaphor of liberty and slavery. So tell us a little right. bit about, because what John Adams said was just outright blunt. Oh, they were all blunt. Because they're politicians, and they want to carry their message. And so what they're doing is they're, they picked up on this Whig metaphor that they've read in all the articles, Addison and Steele, or, and it's all through Locke. But, and they picked up on that, that is, there are two options. There is liberty or there is slavery. And we don't want the Georges to make us slaves for parliamentary rights. Well, applied in America, but they didn't see any chattel slavery around them. You use that metaphor in America, and it soars because you see people being sold in your town, on your square, in Boston Commons, in New York, in Virginia, of course, in, 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 and you see these enslaved people being abused by their owners, being beaten on the streets, everything you'd expect. I mean, this is what was happening. And it going from generation to generation. So when they used the terms, they picked up on this old Whig metaphor and applied it, saying, there is no choice. The Townsend Act, the, um, the, 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 the Stamp Act, they, that makes us slaves. And so, and they directly equated it with the slavery they knew. Afri they, it wasn't the old Greek slavery, it's African slavery. So 
John Adams, and this was not unique. You can find it in Washington. You can find it in, um, in, in um, uh, the most important pamphlets of the day, the pamphlets by Otis, the pamphlets by Sam, uh, writings of Sam Adam, Samuel Adams. Um, he never was Sam. Samuel Adams. Um, the writings of Thomas Jefferson. Didn't matter whether they owned enslaved people themselves or not. And they very directly connected with chattel slavery. So you get John Adams, who never owned an enslaved person in his life, saying, we will not be Parliament's Negroes. That's what he writes. That's what he says. And you see the same to, thing. To me, that makes what you talk about, metaphors yes. of slavery, literally right there. We won't be Parliament's Negroes. That, that's what you mean by it. And Washington says the same thing. Washington says, you know, we're going to be, he will, he will write. They're not going to let, we're going to be clanking around in change just like the people we hold in subjection. We don't want that. That's Washington talking. You see, Patrick Henry, if you actually read with this in mind, but his Give Me Liberty it? or Liberty. Yeah. Can, so so I, I knew this by heart. I, I must have been taught it when I was very young. And I could say this today, you know, give me liberty or give me death. And Patrick Henry. I just assume that's probably all he said. Well, here's the whole sentence. <laughs> if life's so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery, forbid it, almighty God. I know not what co course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That's what you're talking about, metaphors of. Yeah, and they, they sang because people even if, they, even if they're like John Adams and they didn't own any enslaved people, but Patrick Henry owned a lot of enslaved people and he never freed them. Um, the metaphor worked because that's the choice. You're either going to go down this route and you're going to, and there's no other, and several of them will say, there is no choice. You are either, if you let the Townsend Act go, if you don't stand up to the Declaratory Act, we will be just like the people we either own or we see in chained, or we will have liberty. Those are the only two choices in life. So again, this book is just full of things that I learned for the very first time. I guess it's why I like history books. It's why I liked Otto Ferrara's book on Cuba, because I learned so yeah, much that yeah. I didn't know. So you also use a term when you describe the American Revolutionary War, and, and I, I I was astounded by it as the first emancipation. Yeah. Tell us what you meant by that. What I meant by that, and it's a lot like that book you just mentioned um, on Cuba when I heard the talk on that. When they're using this metaphor for some, and not insignificant for a lot of them, they say, well, it'd be totally, and you'll see it in the first great pamphlet of the whole, pro, uh, whole issue, James Otis. Um, for the Stamp Act. He goes through and uses the slavery metaphor and talks about liberty and talks about slavery and then says, and logically, we can't hold anybody in chains. We can't have slavery. And you look at a lot of these founders and um, they, they give up slavery. They listen to this metaphor and they apply it to themselves. So John Hancock frees all of his enslaved people. Franklin frees all his enslaved people. Um, Samuel Adams frees all his enslaved people. Um, there is a, as was happening in Cuba, in the North, where granted slavery wasn't as deeply entrenched, except maybe in New York, but even in New York, there is a, reckon, there is a reckon, recognition that liberty is incompatible with enslaving others. Just like we won't accept it, the British enslaving us. We, and so during the revolution, and this is striking, I mean, during the actual fighting of the revolution, when they have British troops in their own colonies, Pennsylvania abolishes slavery. Massachusetts abolishes slavery. New Hampshire abolishes slavery. The punitive state of Vermont abolishes slavery. It's clear that Rhode Island and Connecticut are going to abolish slavery very soon. 
and um, New York and New Jersey are following right behind. And in all those states, very similar to what she described in Cuba, the, the black people in those states, both the enslaved and the free blacks in those states, enlist in the Revolutionary Army in percentages far higher than the white people. There are, which was shocking to me. I, I there were quite frankly, have never black heard this. People fighting and killed in Lexington and in Concord, Bunker Hill. You just name them. Later on in Yorktown, there were there were the whole red. There was a whole black regiment from Rhode Island. And in every case, they either immediately received or knew they would receive their freedom. The same way was happening in Cuba. And so if you'd fight for on the side of the revolutionaries. If they'd let you. If they'd let you, but then you would be guaranteed that you would become a free black. All the northern states allowed it and they went through the process of abolishing slavery. So in the North, you have your first great, and you can do the numbers, the first great emancipation of enslaved blacks in the history of the world was the American Revolution in the North. That's part of the legacy of slavery and liberty. But at the same time, the South goes the other way. They literally actually see that owning enslaved people is part of their liberty. Patrick Henry makes that clear. James Madison is clear on that respect. You can go all the way around the Pinckneys of South Carolina, who are the largest single slaveholding family in, in the, on the continent. And they go the other way. Not, it's not universal. Just as in the North, it's not universal. There are some people who hold on longer and only give up their enslaved people when the law is passed for mandatory emancipation, such as in Massachusetts or, or New York or wherever. Um, and some Southerners do, like Robert Pleasance in, in Virginia, do free their slaves. They're caught up in this, this new view. But in general, south of the Mason-Dixon line, Maryland, Delaware, south, they go the other way, that part of their liberty is owning slaves because they were the richer ones. And they were the ones who, if they took their enslaved people to England, they would be automatically freed. So they, view, they viewed the southern states, and this is where the, 17, uh, the 1619 project is getting. They ignore what was happening in the north, and they're looking more at what was happening in the south. And so there they double down on slavery. Tell That's us. what part of their liberty. And so as a result is, they're what the African Americans do. And they do in thousands, is the way they get their freedom, is they flee to the British forces when they're close. That's right, I was going to ask, so and tell they, us what the British offered. The British, under the Plattsburgh um, Proclamation, issued by General Clinton, who was the commander in chief of the British armies in North America, he said any, any um, African American, um, who comes and, and joins our side will get their freedom. And so thousands and thousands, including dozens from Washington's plantations, scores from Jefferson's plantations, all the enslaved people from um, um, uh, uh, Peyton Randolph's plantation, they're all dead. They, when, there's a, when there's a British army nearby, they volunteer. So you also get a great emancipation in the South. Not as great, but because a lot of these enslaved people flee to the British, volunteer, or just get behind British lines. They don't have to fight. The old um, Dunsmore Proclamation said they have to fight. But this new one by Clinton, you just have to, So women and children would flee behind British lines and they're free, much like would later happen after the Emancipation Proclamation with uh, Union troops going through the South. And so you had an emancipation in the South. And at the end of the war, to their credit, the British don't give those people back up. And they sail them all off. They go to Nova Scotia. They go to, um, back to England. Or because they go down to the free. new colony. They, because they're free under the British. Right. And the British aren't going to turn them back, even though you know there's Washington. And he's right outside right outside New York, and in the end, the British are, by the time, by the, after Yorktown, the British are, are down to three places. They're owning Charleston, um, uh, Savannah, and New York City. And there, 
all, of course, all the loyalists have pulled back into those three cities, and so have all these large numbers of African Americans. And so there, the British in the deal, they get to board the ships and sail out. And so they're loading, and we have the registry by name. And you'll read down these registries, which I've looked at, where they have the name, and they get to the African uh, American people, or the African people, I guess they'd be called. They'd have their name, and they'd say, you know, Washington's property, or Jefferson's property. And Washington would be saying, give them back, give them back. And the British say, no, we can't give them back. We promised their freedom, and they were. They did sail out. And that's, by the way, that led to the founding of Liberia. No, not Liberia, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone was the British colony in Africa built for, um, to, for the, um, the repatriation of Africans. Uh, Liberia was the one later that the Americans created. And so they went, they went to Nova Scotia. They would go to England, or they would go to uh, uh, Sierra Leone. And they would have some choice in which option they ended up to. So it was a liberation, too. Um, so the result is, if you look at the numbers, it was the first great emancipation. It didn't stick in the South, um, but it did stick in the North. So I, I can't remember now if it was in the book or in a footnote, but you talk about how on the revolutionary side, there were armies where both whites and free blacks fought yeah. so, shoulder to shoulder which didn't happen again to until the, the Korean, Korean War. War. That's true. Um, there were, which because is another were, to me just there so was interesting. So many African Americans, in the, by the time Washington took over command um, in, 17, in the summer of, or the fall summer, after the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, uh, the, the, the command of what had been forming as the Patriot Army um, that was, um, around, the only British army back then in 1775 was in Boston. And the Patriots quickly had an army twice that size of militias, mostly from New England. Um, and Washington came and took command of it and became the con root of the Continental Army. Well, it was filled with African Americans because um, they were volunteering because they viewed it as an avenue of their freedom. And every, every colony w was offering their, every New England colony was offering their freedom if they served. Um, it was filled with African Americans, higher percentage than, than, than white Americans. Which is what we and, found out in Cuba, that during the revolutions, right. it was Absolutely. The, the free blacks from Cuba yeah. fighting alongside the indigenous yeah. and the Spanish yeah. against the Spanish colony. So I, and they I, won medals for their, for their yeah. bravery at, at Bunker Hill. And so Washington took command, and his first instinct was, get all those African Americans out. Out and he gave orders to that effect, and they looked. As, we won't have an army if we send them all home. So he literally changed his mind and said they could stay. And um, so they ended up fighting, through, and they end up. That continues throughout the war. More and more white people didn't want to fight in this endless war. More and more black people did, and so Washington's army, when it went down to Yorktown, had all these um, uh, African Americans in it that marched down, which struck the Virginians, because in Virginia and Maryland and in Carolinas, they wouldn't put an African American, they wouldn't give them a gun, they wouldn't put them in their militia. But here coming down, and when, the, when they brought the army down from New York to, to surround Yorktown, it was filled with African Americans. But you're right, that was the last time that African Americans, and um, it was this, later it was segregated. And so that was the last time that African Americans and white Americans fought shoulder to shoulder in combat until Truman ended the segregation of the army in the, for the Korean War. So I want to jump ahead to the Constitutional Convention and tell us how they dealt with slavery or how they didn't deal with slavery. Well, when you read Madison's notes, Madison uh, tried to keep a some sort of a, um, the only record we have of what happened in the, uh, the Constitutional Convention are Madison's notes. They're not complete, but they're pretty good. I think they're pretty good. Some people will argue that point, how good they are. Um, but they're pretty good, and he keeps down everybody who speaks. He Madison was one of the only two people who was there every day, and he would keep pretty complete records. And so we know the debates going on. And if you read those with, those, with that idea in mind, 
okay, where is slavery? You will realize that slavery was the most divisive issue at the Constitutional Convention. There were other issues. There was big states versus small states. There was how, to, how much power the president should have after the experience with a powerful king and how you elect the president. Those are, those are certainly around. I'm not saying that slavery is the only issue. But they quickly realized that slavery is the big issue because by this time, half the country has either abolished slavery or is on the way to abolish slavery. And they really rejected it, partly because they didn't like the concept of slavery. It's not that they all believed in equal rights for black people. Um, but they also believed in the concept the working class people of America believed in free labor. And they knew they could never compete within slave labor. So if you want to have a free farm, um, if you want to have free labor in a factory, um, you can't have slavery. It's not compatible. So the North is really committed to no slavery. And the South is really committed, because that's how their agriculture and their economy works, is really committed to slavery. Not just the owners of, the, of enslaved people, but also the other whites, the whites that don't own, because they view them, well, we got, we're at least better than that, enslaved people. So, um, so the South is committed to this. And they quickly realize that the biggest division is this, that if we're going to cobble together a true name, because before that, the Articles of Confederation was like the UN. It was a League of Friendship. That's the exact title in it. It's a League of Friendship. You know, and it sort of covers foreign policy. But what Hamilton and Madison, key northerner, key southerner, and Washington and Franklin, the key southerner, a key northerner, and the Pinckneys and um, the representatives Rufus King or whoever from Massachusetts. What they really want, they want a, a unified national economy. Because if we don't have a unified national economy with the power to tax and spend for the general welfare, they all agree on that, and to have an army and a unified foreign policy. And if we don't have a unified economy like the common market, we're limited. We've got every state before that printed its own money and could tariffs against each other state, and the economy couldn't grow. But if you make it one unified economy, think how we'll prosper. And that's what they want to create. And they want a power for the central government to be able to tax and spend for the general welfare because they want to have an army that can throw the British out of the Northwest Territories because they've never left. They've never, and the troops, you know, they. Technically, America, the United States got everything in the Mississippi, but the British forts were still in Michigan and Illinois and everything. And they couldn't defend it, our country. And we couldn't put a tariff because we couldn't, the central government couldn't tax. And therefore, foreign countries put high tariffs on our goods so we couldn't export them, but we couldn't have a retaliatory tariff in America to protect our manufacturing, connect our own, um, because we didn't, the central government didn't have the power to raise a tariff. And sure, New York State could. But some state won't do it, and so the goods will just flow into Rhode Island and then trickle into New York. So, so, so you couldn't have economy. But they realized what divided us. I, I, we're, I wanted to remind you, because I got another couple good okay. questions. So, so what divided quickly them tell was us slavery. what they did. What, divi what divided them was slavery. And they quickly realized that the Madison of several speeches, that the only thing that really divides us, it's not big states and small states. It's states with slavery and states with freedom. That's what divides us. Madison gives this speech often. Governor Morris, the key writer of the preamble, gives this speech often. So how do we create a, a constitution that creates a federal union, an economic union, a, and a military, and the power to tax, while at the same time protecting slavery in the states? They knew if they wrote a pro-slavery constitution, it would never be ratified in the North. And so people who say the constitution was pro-slavery are just wrong, because it never would have been ratified in the North. But they couldn't write an anti-slavery constitution, because it would never be ratified in the South. And Franklin on one side, an abolitionist, Washington on the other side, they wanted a strong national government. So how do we do it? So they create a government that protects state-sanctioned slavery in the states, but doesn't enforce it. And in the middle, the most, the funniest thing in the world, I mean, it's a 
weirdest thing in the world. They're going along, and the Continental Congress is all, uh, the Confederation Congress is almost powerless. They hadn't had a they hadn't had a quorum in five years to do things. They break for two weeks in the middle of the Constitutional Convention, because so many of them are members of the of Confederation Congress. They go up. They leave Philadelphia, go up to New York to do the one significant thing that the Confederation Congress ever does, establish the Northwest Ordinance. They leave, they adjourn the convention for two weeks. The deal with that is the new Northwest Ordinance, which organizes the territories that become Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan, bars slavery in those territories. And the reason why that was key is these free states in the North they need an avenue to go west to spread free soil and free labor west. And so that's part of the deal. The Constitution wouldn't work. But they also go to every state gets two senators or equal representation in the Senate because they're going to be the exact same number of free states and, sl and slave states once Vermont, which they knew was coming right away, Vermont, Kentucky, and Tennessee come in. And the three-fifths compromise is carefully designed that if you give three-fifths, if you give white Southerners three-fifths of a vote for all their enslaved backs, you end up with the same number, the best they could tell, the same number of members of Congress from north of the Mason-Dixon line to south. And then if you extend that compromise to create a new thing, which comes at the end of the Electoral College, because the North is pushing for direct election for president. That's what Franklin wants. That's what everybody in the North wants, because they have more votes. The South doesn't want to do that, and so they come up with the Electoral College, because if you throw the three-fifths compromise into the Electoral College. So the Electoral College was not designed to have elite people to run the, run the um, election. The Electoral College is only there to protect slavery in the South, because then you're going to equal balance the two areas. And so, and as long as you have the West, as long as you have the West compromise going west, these states will be coming in on the north part of the west, in the nor old Northwest Territory. They're becoming in free. And in the south part, the, when they have an Alabama and a, and a, a Mississippi, they're going to become enslaved, and you're going to keep the balance. So it's all set up. And you could look at all the other compromises. They're all set up, designed to make sure this Constitution is not pro-slavery. It's not anti-slavery, but it protects state-sanctioned slavery in states that want to have it. So long answer. There's Sorry. so many great stories in here. What I love about Edward's books is they're well-researched, they're well-footnoted, they are historically correct, but they read almost like a novel. They're easy to read, they're fun to read, but I know we only have one minute left, and this is something you and I talked about, um, that this was... This, this topic, these source materials, and in the last 50 seconds, tell us how it emotionally impacted you. Well, they're incredible stories. They're incredible stories of George Washington's, um, George Washington's former enslaved people, like David Payne, um, or Harold, uh, uh, or, or, or you know, some of the others, on the ships waiting to sail out of New York Harbor after the um, and the winds haven't changed yet. They've all boarded the ships in New York Harbor to leave, and then Washington comes in, and the fireworks are going off to welcome, finally, the liberation of New York. And they're looking there, and they're commenting, well, he wasn't a liberator to us. And you also have stories about uh, Phyllis Wheatley, or, or, um, or uh, one, of his, one of Washington's enslaved people, it's so funny, Washington's serving as president in Philadelphia, and. And, and, and our, we're out of time. Oh, we're going to turn off our mics. You're going to have to read the book about Own a Judge. <laughs> but it's a and, human and story. And sweetly. So thank you very much. You can see how well-knowledged he is about this. So thank you. Thank you thank so you much. much. Sorry, thank I can't. You.